going to see you on Sunday. If you have your Bible, what you do, go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is where we spend our time. I want to talk to you this morning uh, about an unusual and uncommon union. An unusual and uncommon union. Let me explain to you a little bit about what I mean. Is that uh, two people would enter into a covenant with their Lord and into a covenant with one another, right? And that that union, that uncommon and unusual uh, union, uh, is extreme, uh, extraordinarily odd to our culture. And the, the culture that we live in. Uh, it, 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 they find it a difficult and strange thing that two people would love one another and love their Lord and commit their lives to one another. You see, the culture we live in would tell us, well, you know, if you don't get along with one another, then just divorce. Uh, if you don't get along with one another, uh, then perhaps, if you know, if you're struggling financially, then maybe you should have separate accounts and each of you just pay whatever you can. Or, or if you're not happy uh, in your relationship sexually, then just go out and try other partners. It, it, it's common. And the fact that the, the, the church would say, and that scripture would teach, and that the Bible would teach, no, you don't do those things, you commit your lives to one another, is extraordinarily uncommon and unusual. It's a strange thing that a man and a woman would, would commit their lives not only to the Lord, but to one another. It's an unusual and uncommon union. The Athenian uh, philosopher Plato, he said that the life of a nation is the life of its families writ large. The life of a nation is the life of its families writ large. Yet, it's like one guy said, uh, people today aren't married by the justice of the peace, they're married by the secretary of war. Amen? <laughs> many homes, though, many marriages have become sort of this, this toxic battleground where every conversation and every event and, and every decision is like this landmine that has to be tiptoed around. Husbands step over wives and wives step over husbands and, and parents step over children and children step over their parents. And the entire time, uh, there is Plato saying, the life of a nation is the life of its family at large. That our nation was built on the idea of a Christian family. A Christian unit. Statistically speaking, half of all customers, uh, customers, half of all couples who marry today will divorce at some point. Half of all uh, couples will divorce at some point. And again, there's Plato shouting, but your nation's life depends on this. The greatest of the problems facing our nation today is that we are, A, not, no longer a godly nation, but then B, we are a nation that has allowed the family unit to be broken and that society has no answer. Society has no answer for what's happening to the family today. That it's being redefined by the culture. That truth is no longer absolute. That if you want to marry another man, if you're a man. If you want to marry a woman, if you're a woman. If you want to marry multiple people. If you want to marry your dog or a computer, go ahead. Because truth is no longer absolute. God's Word is absolute. And God's Word tells and describes exactly what a godly marriage should look like. And from time to time, we need to hear this and be reminded of it. Now, I don't believe all hope is lost for our nation. I believe we need a great revival. We need people to return to the Lord. And I believe it starts with the family. I believe it starts with what uh, Paul is teaching the Ephesians here in chapters 5 and 6. We won't have time to get into 6. That is a separate sermon for a different day. But we will spend time in chapter 5 this morning from 21 all the way down uh, to verse 29. Notice what he says first in verse 21. He says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now that's us, brothers and sisters. He sort of, it's a continuation of a previous thought, but it applies here today in talking about submission. That believers, that people who, who believe like-minded things as it relates to Christianity, who serve and worship together in the same church, that we should be mutually submissive to one another. That believers should submit and be subject, subject to one another. That we should be mutually submissive. In its simplest terms, it means that sometimes you get your way and sometimes you don't. And that happens a lot in churches. 
And sometimes you get in your way. And when you do get in your way, you don't brag and you don't boast and you don't make a deal out of it. And when you don't get in your way, you don't pout, you don't sulk, and you don't make a deal out of it. <laughs> because Paul tells the Ephesians, and God's Word tells us, we submit to one another in love. Hey, think about it. To be in heaven together is a long time. Amen? We should figure out how to get along now. We submit to one another. That's how he starts it. And then from verses 22 through 29, he, he breaks this down even more. He expands upon it for the idea of the family. He works out that same principle. He talks about the submissive role of the wife first. He talks about the submissive role of the husband. You heard that right? The husband. There's an expectation that he be submissive. He breaks all of that down for us. Now, I want you to know I tread lightly. And I preach this sermon to you because I'm still new and you still love me. Okay? Um, <laughs> But it can be a hot topic for, for, for men and women, for husbands and wives. Fortunately, the Bible is clear on how the marriage should be established and set up. It's clear how the family unit should work. Also, I want you to remember that the family is God's idea, not man's. And for God's idea to work, His idea must work on His terms. We don't get to redefine that for Him. He doesn't need our redefinition. That's just the way it is. So let's go through uh, these seven, eight verses together. Number one, first and foremost, Paul begins his instruction by talking to wives. First, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Look at verses 22 through 24 with me. This is what Paul says. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And there, if you are a feminist, you have the most despised verses in all of Scripture. <laughs> and the reason why this word submit is so hated and is so despised is because it's a word that has been so abused. Right? It's a word that has been redefined, at least in our society, but it has not been biblically redefined. There's no need to. So let me give you a couple of reasons, wives and, and husbands, I want you to listen to this as well because it applies to you. A couple of reasons that I see here uh, that you need to submit yourselves unto your own husbands and what that means. First and foremost, wives, support his biblical headship. Support your husband's biblical headship. Paul clearly says that a woman who is a wife, who is married, and has a husband is to subject herself. Watch this now. She is to subject herself. That means place herself underneath the biblical headship of her husband. Ladies, this principle has nothing at all to do with your essence, has nothing at all to do with your worth, and has nothing at all to do with your value. It has nothing at all to do with the chain of command. Your, your husband is not more valuable to the Lord than you are. He may think he is, but he's not. What Paul is getting at here is completely related to function. He's talking about role in the home. He's talking about responsibility. And the reason why the word submit has caused so much trouble is because it's misunderstood and it's mistaught to mean that a woman is less than a man and that simply is not true. The Bible declares that we are all one in Christ, right? That every woman is equal to their husband in terms of their worth. This means that when God looks at you wives, He looks at you husbands, He sees two equally created people. Now, just like in any business, you'll have an hourly worker who probably reports to a supervisor, and you'll have a supervisor who reports to a manager, and you'll have a manager who reports to a CEO. As human beings, they are all equal in value, but their roles are different. That's the same with a husband and a wife. Paul makes it plain that the husband is the head of the wife, and this concept of headship, it's not a dictatorship, okay? It's not a concept of, of dominance. It's, it's not a, a concept of, of, of me, Tarzan, and you, Jane, right? <laughs> Which is how so many people want to set it up. What Paul is talking about is recognizing the fundamental principle of headship that the husband is the leader of the home. Now, I know some ladies think and say that they are a better leader than he is, and that's not the point. You may be a better boss than your boss. But guess what? 
He's still the boss. Or she's still the boss. The point is about who has the position, not the ability. It's about positional headship. Now, wives, if you have more ability in certain areas, then you should be using those abilities not to replace his position as husband, but to strengthen his position as husband. To enhance his position. To make him better. To support his position. But never to tear down his position. Adrian, for the most part, has always maintained our checkbook. And she's done a great job. She's consistent. She's organized. She has a method to make sure the house payment is made. The lights always stay on. There's always water coming out of the faucet. She does a great job with those things. She doesn't lead me in those areas, but she is better at managing it, so she does, and then we talk about where and how money should be distributed. We have finance committee meetings. We did uh, this Dave Ramsey thing where we went through all of our debt, we cleaned all that up, we got all that squared away, now we have finance committee meetings every couple Saturdays in the morning. Drink a cup of coffee and talk about the books. She does that. She does it well. Now, I'm better and more patient with tasks that need to be accomplished online. So when Ryland was going to college, I had to take care of all the paperwork. All of those things of getting it filled out and getting them submitted. Um, I, I take care of managing our retirement accounts. I, I do the paperwork that went back and forth with the, the realtor and the finance company when we bought our home and and, and the prescriptions on Walgreens, I manage all of that. And I pick those things up and all that stuff. She despises it. She wants no part of those things. And so I take care of those. I'm better because of the things she's good at and take care of and helps me with. And she is better because of the things I'm good at and I take care of. But ultimately, at the end of the day, any of the major decisions that have to be made lie at my feet. And she'll say, okay, buddy, what do you want to do? And she knows and I know and understand that God holds me responsible for those decisions. If I mess up and make a bad decision, God's angry with me, not her. Why? Because I'm the leader of the home. That's what Paul is clearly teaching here. That the husband is to be the leader, the headship. Now, here's the thing for the wives that you may or may not realize. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. You don't have to go there. Let me just tell you what it says. It declares that when the wife lives in rebellion and does not recognize her husband's headship, that the angels aren't even available to her because she has come outside of God's system of authority. So this process of, of a headship, of the husband being head of the home, is so important that when the wife refuses to recognize God's requirements for her, even heavenly things are Paul goes on a little bit further and in letter B, what I want to tell you here is uh, not only should you support his headship, but supply him encouragement. And wives, you know as well as I do, we need a lot of that. We need to be patted on the back. It's not probably too much sometimes, but it's up to you to supply that encouragement. And I know some of you wives are probably thinking, you know, how far does this thing of encouragement go? How far does this thing of submission go? Because he says that a wife is to submit to her husband, verse 22, as to the Lord. I want to make it clear that there is a limit to submission. There's limitation there. What's the limitation? The limitation is when the husband uses his position as head to demand things of the wife outside of that which is acceptable to Christ. Husbands, if you demand something of your wife and it's outside of what is acceptable to Christ, you're sinning and you need to repent. The husband's headship is limited to that which is acceptable to God, not just what he wants to get up and do today. The husband has to operate within the example of Christ. Christ is the head of the husband, and so the husband must operate within Christ's requirements for him as a husband. Your responsibility as a wife is to encourage him in that way, to provide that support in that way. And if your husband is operating in this biblical framework within this headship under Jesus Christ, then you're obligated to follow that lead. If you really love Jesus and, and, and if you are a better leader, he should become better because of you because he has a great partner. And you encourage him in that way. Tell you something else that we miss today in today's society 
is people that come into our home and people that come into our lives aren't sure who the leader is. The truth of the matter is, is that it should be clear to your husband, it should be clear to the Lord, it should be clear to the children, to the family, it should be clear to everyone who enters your home and comes into your life, it should be crystal clear that he is the head and he's the leader of the home. That's supporting him. That's encouraging him. And that's what God expects of you according to Scripture. Now, do we get it right 100% of the time? Nope. <laughs> Not even close, do we? We don't. There are times that there's a struggle. There's a pushing back and forth against one another. There's a, a tug of war. But, but then there's also grace and then there's mercy. And there will be a falling out over something. But then in Christ, the two of you come back together and you work it out and then you make up. Boy, you're making up is good, amen? It's good to make up when you're married. And it's good to the Lord. It's a wonderful relationship. And wives, you have that responsibility. Support his biblical headship and encourage him. Encourage him. Pat him on the back. Tell him he's doing a good job as a husband. Tell him he's doing a good job as a believer. Listen, your opinion means more than anyone else's in this world, or at least it should. Now, I want to spend the bulk of our time on husbands, okay? Let's talk about husbands for a few minutes. Uh, secondly, number two in this sermon, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives, husbands. The husband's to love his wife. He should seek, listen to this, fellas, he should seek her best interest even at his own expense. Husbands should seek her best interest even at his own expense. I think there are three ways in which this happens. Number one, or letter A, under number two, be like her Savior. Be like her Savior. Notice verse 22. I'm sorry, verse 25. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. What did it cost Christ for His love for the church? Somebody tell me. His life. He gave His life for the church. So husbands, what do you got to do if you love your wife? You have to die to self. And listen, that's the worst kind of death that there is. To give up what is important to you in order to meet the need of another person can be quite painful. Jesus Christ gave up His life. Think about it. Jesus Christ gave up His life, which means He left heaven, He left all of His heavenly prerogatives to meet a need here in this world. And we need to be challenged by that, husbands, in that what negotiable things, what prerogatives do we need to give up to meet the needs of our wife? Because that is what God's called us to do as husbands. You ever stop to think that before God gave Eve to Adam, he had to give up a little bit of his life? He had to bleed in order for her to come to existence. God put him to sleep, slid a slide open, took a piece out of him, and created a woman. He had to give up a little bit of his life. And I think that's one of the hardest things for husband, but it's so necessary that you must decide as a husband, I'm going to be a savior to my wife. I'm going to die to myself so that her needs are met. I'm going to be just as much like Christ as I can possibly be. And here's the deal, fellas. This is going to sound funny at first, but hang with me. Here's the deal. I don't see anything at all in these verses about you being happy. But we hear that all the time. Pastor, I'm just not happy. Who cares? It's not about you being happy. Nothing in these verses point to your happiness. Happiness is not the issue of here. A decision of the will is that issue here. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying God wants you to be miserable. What I am saying is that your happiness is not God's first concern. You being a little Christ in your home is. That's what God has called us as husbands to do and to be. And so we are her Savior. Then we need to help to sanctify her. Help to sanctify that wife of yours. Look at verse 26. Paul says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And so when we think through those verses, the word sanctify there means to set apart, to make holy. It's a process of spiritual development. It means that you are to be set apart from God in a process that takes you from where you are and turns you into what you ought to be for God. It's a lifelong process. That's what sanctification does. 
And one of the husband's primary roles is to help sanctify his wife. You have to be her sanctifier. And here's the deal. It's hard. That's a task. It, it, it's a challenge because men, when you married your wife, you didn't just marry your wife. You married everything about your wife, including all of her history up until that point. You married everything about her up in, until that point in her life. Most of the stuff she hid from you until you got married. And you know she did. She can't let you see all that because then you wouldn't have married her. And that's all women want to do is get married. When y'all were dating, boy, she was kind and, and she was loving. She hung on every word. Of course she did. She wanted to get married. And so then you get married and the first thing she does is she takes off the makeup. She takes off her socks and shoes. And you're like, man, okay, here we go. Here we go. And all of a sudden, that little quiet lady who was so kind and so loving and, and so respectful, now all of a sudden, she wants to talk all the time. All the time. And men aren't like that, are we? I can see one of you in Lowe's. I can say, hey, buddy, how you doing? Buddy will say, I'm doing fine, and I know everything I need to know about buddy, and we can go on. <laughs> not women. Not wives. Wives don't like that. She says, why don't you ever talk to me? The only time you ever want to talk is when we're in the bedroom. And you only want to talk in the bedroom before you know what happens. And after you know what, you don't want to talk to me anymore. And why won't you ever communicate with me? All of that was there the whole time. She wants to know what's going on with you. She just wants to talk. And you have to help sanctify her. Make her holy. Bring her closer to the Lord. And that involves talking and communication. The woman that you married, husbands, is a subtotal of all of her experiences, both good and bad. If she was raised by a domineering mother, some of that rubbed off on her. If she was raised by an insensitive father, some of that rubbed off on her. Why? Because women are wired with an emotional magnet inside of them. And this emotional magnet, it picks up all of these different emotions from all of the people in their lives. We, as men, pick things up too, but the job of the husband, unlike the wife, is to be the sanctifier. And so she brings all of this stuff into her marriage, and you find out that you've got a lot more than you bargained for. And it's now time for the sanctifier to step up to the plate. And your job as sanctifier is to say, okay, this is my wife, this is who she is, how can I help her to draw closer to the Lord? It's interesting, isn't it? The real roles and the real responsibilities of the husband. Now, let's say that she has 20 characteristics, and let's say 10 of those characteristics are how she is not supposed to be as a Christian wife and mother. Again, she's the subtotal of all her experiences. There's a lot happening in there. The question on the floor now is not to get rid of her because she doesn't meet your qualifications. The question is what must you do as the sanctifier to do the sanctifying in the process of sanctification? How are you making her more holy? How are you helping her to draw closer to the Lord? What support are you providing her? It's interesting that Christ cares for us even in our imperfections. Amen? And husbands, what Christ is letting us see and what we have to go through with our wives is what He has to go through with us. And we have a lot left to be desired as far as Jesus is concerned, but He doesn't divorce us and He doesn't give up on us because we keep messing up. He keeps the process of sanctification going. He keeps making us as husbands holy. And that's what we as husbands have to do. And it's tiring and it's difficult and it's a lifelong process and it can be traumatic but there are a lot of things in life that are your responsibility and it's your responsibility to help her draw closer to the Lord. And if you're living a kind of life that doesn't do so, if you're living a kind of life that pushes her farther and further and further away from the Lord, God is going to hold you accountable and responsible. And you need to repent. Because He wants you to be like Him. That's why the husbands must be the head in terms of spiritual growth. So he has something that he can pass on to his wife and to his family. You be like her Savior husbands. You help to sanctify her. And then finally, you be the one who satisfies her. Let her see. You be the one who satisfies her. Look at verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, 
just as the Lord does the church. So now if you are the satisfier, you are the one that takes the lead in the meeting of her needs. And what Paul is saying is whatever you do for you, you have to do for her because she is an extension of you. Listen, men, when you don't do for her what that when you don't do for her that which meets her needs, you have denied yourself something from God. You deny what God has told you to do. And that you are to meet her needs. You're to meet her needs emotionally. You're to meet her needs spiritually. You're to meet her needs physically, sexually, financially. Just as you would do for yourself, you are to do for that woman. You know why? Because when God looks at the two of you, He doesn't see two anymore. He sees one. That a man would leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. That even in the description there in Genesis and in God's original design, in the very act of sex, two people become one. And God sees you and your wife as one person in all things. So what you do for you, you have to do for her. You have to meet those needs. That's why homes today, even Christian homes, are so chaotic. Because husbands have refused to meet the needs of the wives. You have one person in God's eyes who are constantly going in separate directions. You have one person in God's eyes who has separate checkbooks, have separate interests, live separate lives, some sleep in separate beds, they have separate goals, separate ideas, separate friends, all of this separation, and it just leads to chaos in the home because you're not pulling toward one flesh. You're pulling against each other. The Bible says that the man who does not meet the needs of his wife, you know what happens in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7? To a man that doesn't meet the needs of his wife, his prayers are hindered. That's how important this concept is to Christian men and Christian husbands. Men say, I don't know what's happening. I feel lost. I feel confused. I, I feel unhappy. God isn't answering my prayers. I feel disconnected from the Lord. That may be because you aren't taking care of your wife appropriately. It may be because you aren't meeting her needs. You, you romanced her without limit before you got married and you ain't been on a date since the honeymoon. Amen? It's like the one lady. A tornado was coming through town and she and her husband were laying in bed and the, the tornado ripped the roof off the house. They had been married for years and years and it, it ripped the bed up. The bed's flying through the air. It's swirling in the tornado. And she's laughing and crying all at the same time. They can't figure it out. The bed was spinning around in the tornado. They're about to die. Why in the world is she laughing and crying? So he says, what are you doing? Why are you laughing about this? She says, this is the first time we've been out of the house in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then one guy said it's going to take a tornado for some of you men to meet your responsibility. <laughs> Most men date to marry when in the Bible you should marry to date. Now, men, you didn't go up to that woman when you were trying to win her over and say, you want to do something? What you want to do? No, you had it all planned out, didn't you? You need to plan some stuff. Plan some dates for your wife. Plan some fun things. Get away for a few days. Just take care of her. Satisfy our needs. We're supposed to support and meet the needs of our wives. We're supposed to know our wives. We're supposed to study our wives. There are two things in life we need to study, men. Our Bible and our wives. Because both are incredibly difficult to understand. Amen? <laughs> Tony Evans says this, and I'll close. The husband is the, therm is the thermostat. The wife is the thermometer. Don't expect a summer wife when all you bring home is winter weather. Amen? <laughs> Husbands, be her savior. Be her sanctifier. Be the one who satisfies and meets all of her needs. Wives, support his headship in the home. Be his supplier of encouragement. We don't always get it right. We struggle. We don't always follow the biblical principle for, to a T, but God has laid it out for us. Sure, it's Paul teaching the Ephesians, but it's Paul teaching us today about how husbands and wives should treat one another. The idea of one man and one woman committing their lives not only to the Lord, but one to one another. It is an unusual and uncommon union. Amen? But it is so vitally important. Father in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to just come and gather around your word. Lord, I pray we'll take the principles that have been learned here from Ephesians chapter 5 and think through what it means to be a husband and what it means to be a wife. 
Lord, would you help us to apply these principles to our own marriages? If we've fallen short, Lord, I pray that you'll convict us, that you'll lead us closer to you, that you'll keep us close to the cross. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for loving us even when we fall short. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.